Assalamu alaikum everybody. So in this week, uh, we are going to discuss public personnel management. Um, so this is currently according to the outline that we, I had um, come up with. This is part of the week eight lesson. And if you guys remember, um, we, we briefly touched upon what public personnel management is in week eight, uh, already before the meds. Um, just to guys, let you guys know about how we are going to go about it. So in this particular session, I'm going to explain what public personnel management is and we're going to spend considerable amount of time discussing what are the different elements of public personnel management. So the idea is that in this session, I'm going to uh, talk to, uh, to you guys about some generic elements of public personnel management and how it's basically studied within the broader field of public administration. However, in the subsequent week, which is week nine, we are going to discuss uh, civil services of Pakistan which are basically um, how public personnel management is practiced within the context of Pakistan. So without further ado let's begin. Uh, let's start with defining what public personnel management is. So let's first of all talk about this term personnel. So personnel basically refers to uh, employees of an organization and generally this term personnel has uh, is used uh, sort of like a collective term for different employees working in an organization and it ha actually has a uh, military origin. Um, the, the private sector counterpart of the same term personnel is basically human resource. So within the private sector, it's not called public personnel management, but rather it's actually termed as public uh, human resource management. So there has been quite a lot of debate within the broader field of public administration, whether we should use um, this term public personnel management or should we stick to human resource management. So there hasn't been any, uh, you can say, consensus within the field of um, public administration. So how do we define public personnel management? So it's basically concerned with the procurement, um, the utilization, the compensation, and development of a public organization's workforce. So let's try to understand these individual terms. So what do we mean by procurement? Procurement basically means how do we get the labor force, how do we get the employees to work in our organization. So this particular term refers to the um, recruitment, essentially the recruitment process, which is in place in different public organization. Uh, when we talk about utilization, it basically means how do we use the employees that we have recruited uh, in our organization, how do we use their talents and skills to achieve organization goals and missions. Then moving on to this term compensation, this basically signifies that you, how do you pay wages, um, how do you pay compensation to your employees? Because naturally all of us know that um, whoever works in either public sector or private sector, he or she has to be compensated in a certain manner. And this compensation deals with both the monetary benefits as well, plus the non-monetary benefits as well, which can basically um, be a range of perks and privileges which are provided to employees. The last element of this definition is development of your organization's workforce. By development, we basically mean how do we constantly update the skill set um, of our employees essentially and how what kind of mechanisms do we have in place to ensure their training, right? So I hope you understand the definition of public personnel management. So let's move on um, to what is the difference between personnel administration and personnel management. So within the uh, public administration literature, again, uh, the earlier or the classical studies or the traditional model of public administration basically dealt with personnel administration. That was uh, the term which was used was administration. And um, you can say the contemporary literature has talked about personnel management as opposed to personnel administration. So let's quickly discuss what do we mean by these two terms and what is the distinction. So as uh, mentioned on the slides, personnel administration strictly deals with the technical aspects of maintaining workforce within an organization. By technical aspects, we mean how do we get the workforce? How do we recruit the employees? How do we use them? How do we compensate them? Uh, what kind of disciplinary actions can we take against if they are involved in some sort of misconduct, right? So all of the technical details are related uh, or they come under this broader term of personal administration. Personal management on the other hand is basically concerned with not just the technical aspects of maintaining a workforce, but it also deals with 
sort of the behavioral aspects of your employee for employees as well you are concerned with things like how do you keep your workforce motivated how do you ensure that they are actually productive how do you ensure that they are satisfied with the work that they are doing so that's essentially personnel management and if you remember from the the schools of thoughts of public administration that we had done um, in like week two or week three uh, this notion of personnel management where you're focusing on the behavioral aspect of employees is tilted or closely linked to the behavioral school of thought essentially and the contemporary sort of uh, school of thought which proposes this notion of personnel management and a shift away from personnel administration is um, new public management which basically is quite um, employee oriented and talks about you know ensuring that your employees are motivated held responsible for the work that they do and they're generally interested in in um, serving the public sector so moving on uh, i think it makes sense that before we discuss the elements of public personnel management we understand why it's so important why it's so significant to study public personnel management systems so um, ppm or public personnel management is a, a significant element of government administrative systems uh, because naturally the effective or um, the efficient conduct of the work of government will ultimately depend on the quality of the workforce that you are able to attract. So if you have, um, if you compromise on the quality of your workforce or if you're not getting in a lot of skilled um, labor, skilled employees in your organization naturally it's going to have an impact on the type of services which are going to be provided by public organizations so by having a sound uh, public personnel management system you essentially ensure that public agencies have competent staff skilled staff which perform government functions in an adequate manner another important element is that you ensure that you have sufficient sufficient number of staff as well because you must have heard this term and i've mentioned it in our previous lectures as well there's this a term uh, which is used turnover rate turnover rate essentially means how frequently uh, employees in your organization leave the organization so let's say uh, if oh, an organization is a high turnover within a year it means it it give it should give signal to the higher authorities that your employees are basically unhappy with the organization and they are leaving the organization quite a lot so your, your public agency essentially has to ensure that at some point in time or during the entire year or so you have the steady supply or enough um, sort of uh, employees working in your organization and you shouldn't be facing any sort of shortage of labor um, the second element about PPM is that it basically by having a sound mechanism of public personnel management system, you ensure that your staff or employees working in your organization are adequately equipped by having the necessary skills to perform their roles. And this last element is basically linked to the training and um, development aspect of public personnel management system. You need to ensure that your um, employees have a have up-to-date skills and meeting the modern challenges of governance so let's move on now uh, to discuss what are some of the elements which go into the public personnel system of any organization uh, with particular focus on public organizations so uh, you can actually see this um, picture uh, that i've taken from green's book and in this particular, I think this is a really nice uh, picture and it basically, I mean, if you notice, like this is the box, uh, which basically signifies when you're working in a public organization. So this is how when you basically become part of a public organization, these four uh, like circles, they basically sig signify the entry points into uh, a public organization so there are essentially four entry points um, uh, to joining the public sector and in a bit we'll discuss them uh, in detail what they are um, and this this bottom part basically includes how do you leave um, your organization so there are three ways according to green that you can leave a public organization you can either be dismissed you can be retired or you can resign so the idea is that in the ne next couple of slides we'll uh, discuss all of these elements in detail right 
So, um, I mean, I can just quickly go over it. Once you're part of the public sector organization, you have to deal with elements related to staffing. I'll explain it in a bit. We'll discuss what classification and compensation are. Then we'll discuss how to develop a training and management system. Then you also need to pay attention to how do you advance or how do you, what is the promotion criteria within your public organization. And uh, the, the last element within uh, this, this bigger uh, rectangular box is how do you have a system, how do you ensure that um, uh, you can, uh, how do you ensure that you can discipline the conduct of your public employees. And this bit about grievances basically deals with that if as a public sector employee, I have certain issues um, or certain concerns uh, with my organization, or if I feel that my rights have been violated, what kind of mechanisms, complaint mechanisms essentially do I have in which I can lodge my complaint or my grievance. So the idea is that in the next couple of um, slides, we are going to discuss all of these elements in detail. So let's begin. So how do you enter the public sector? So according to Frederick Moshe, there are um, different entry points of joining um, the public sector. So the first way to uh, join the public sector is through the system of political appointees. And we've discussed the system of political appointees quite a bit uh, before. Uh, political appointees basically essentially mean that your your prime minister or your president basically um, selects a certain group of advisors or certain uh, provide uh, or ser assign certain key positions to people who are not directly elected by the general public. So in the past, I think I've also given you this example of the U.S. Um, uh, you know presidential system, thereby whereby um, the U.S. president has been given this leeway that he can appoint. Um, uh, heads of agencies of certain key agencies for example somebody who's working in FBI or CAI he doesn't necessarily have to be directly elected but rather uh, the the US president could just pick and choose uh, whoever he wants to to be become part of the cabinet in the case of Pakistan a good example of political appointees is uh, when Prime Minister Imran Khan appoints various advisors um, for different portfolios. So we have an advisor for, you know, the health related affairs, we have an advisor on communication as well, we have an advisor on multiple different portfolios. So these are individuals who haven't been, you know, directly elected by you and I, but rather these are people who are experts in their field and they have, they have been appointed to become part of the government apparatus. So that, so that's basically one way to enter the public service. The other way to enter the public service, which we have discussed quite a lot already, is through this channel of general civil service system. And the general civil service system is the system whereby individuals or employees are recruited by conducting competitive screening tests. So Pakistan, in Pakistan, we have the civil services exams. So that's just an example of um, having this general civil service system. You have a law which designates uh, that these competitive exams need to be um, held within the country, either on a federal level or on a provincial level. And then you have detailed rules about how these um, tests need to be carried out. The third system, a way to enter the public services through the system of career system. So this career system is sort of is situated outside the general civil system. And the distinction between the general civil service system and the career system is that these organizations which are following a career system have they've developed their own career uh, model systems, which mean is that they have their own recruitment processes and they are quite different from the general civil services system. For example, military, in the case of Pakistan, um, like the army has its own recruitment process, own set of rules which are governing their public personnel management system. For instance, if you want to enter this, uh, the, 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 the army armed forces, you have to essentially take the ISS 
ISSP test and you know they have a different screening mechanism so that's the career system the fourth type of entry point in the public service is the collective system so collective system is any uh, public sector employment which is governed through collective bargaining agreements so collective bargaining agreement what are collective bargaining agreements so these are basically agreements uh, which the employees try to negotiate with their employers. So I'm sure you must have heard this notion of labor unions, right? Um, in in they, they, There's a long history of labor unions. And just to tell you a bit of a background about labor unions, they were actually started in the private sector way back in the industrial age. And the reason why labor unions were created during that time was because employees weren't getting their rights in terms of their health and safety in terms of their wages and compensation so they basically created these collective um, sort of four hours whereby they can challenge or where they by they whereby they can negotiate with their employers to provide them welfare benefits or to provide them rights um, which are good for their employment basically so increasingly labor unions like in in the present scenario the public sectors in certain countries of the world allow uh, the formulation of labor unions in certain organizations public organizations is absolutely barred that you cannot become part of a labor union but in other organizations you can actually formulate a labor union and if you're part of a labor union you can collectively negotiate with an employer about your pay packages or if some incident for instance happened you can you know strike or do some sort of a protest to ensure that your the public organization gives in to your demands so in case of pakistan a good example of this collective system is um, uh, this uh, labor union which is available for railway employees so um, so the lower level or you can say the clerical staff of railways is you can say governed by this collective system whereby they can bargain and negotiate with the railway authorities so now let's move on to the second element of human uh, of um, public personnel management so you must have seen that this element of human resource planning has uh, wasn't mentioned previously here so this is something that i have included because um, increasingly uh, human resource planning has been incorporated in public personnel management systems and as I mentioned before, this element of human resource signifies that uh, that we are this sort of um, uh, term of human resource basically signifies that we are essentially using the private sector jargon. And if you remember our previous discussion on um, you know new public management, new public management increasingly advocates for the use of private sector techniques. So a lot of countries of the world who have moved or shifted towards adopting new public management system have engage in this element of human resource planning. So what do we mean by human resource planning? Simply it's a process of determining future staff requirements and the skills necessary to carry out the objectives of the organization. So here you're just predicting in advance or you're being a little proactive and planning what kind of uh, individuals do you need for your public organizations? What kind of skills do you need in the future? for instance right so what are this uh, what are some of the elements of planning so first of all you need to define the corporate policy of your public organization you need to essentially assess what kind of um, uh, things that you want to achieve in your organization because naturally according to the vision and the mission and the goals of your organization you're essentially going to attract the right kind of organization uh, sorry the right kind of public servants the next element is you need to establish a forecast of demand for new employees like in the future, in the next year, or in the next two years or in the next five years, how many employees do you need and what kind of skills and expertise do they need, right? So let's say um, a public organization um, basically plans that they are going to adopt a digitization in the future. They're going to use uh, or shift towards e-governance mechanism naturally in the future they would like to attract employees which are sort of tech savvy or which have the right digital skills as well the next component of uh, planning is 
that you need to have an inventory of current personnel. Inventory basically means a list. You need to know exactly how many individuals are employed in your uh, organization. So based on this inventory, you can actually do a forecast that if there's a shortage or you can say um, if there are too many people employed in your organization, you can see how many individuals you can um, recruit in the future. The fourth element within planning is that you need to do an analysis of manpower supply. What that means is that you need to sort of do an analysis of the market in which you are operating. So let's say we are a public organization which is based in Islamabad. So we need to see what kind of graduates are coming out of Islamabad universities. Or if you are targeting experienced individuals, we want to see what kind of organizations can existing organizations can we tap into to get or to attract you know people working in our organization. So that's an analysis of manpower supply. And the fourth component, uh, the last sorry component is that you need uh, to have the right kind of program which includes elements of recruitment, training, uh, transferring, which is you know moving your staff from one place to another, or reducing staff if you have you have if you feel that you've employed too many people, right? So these are some of the elements of uh, human resource planning. So moving on, so the next step, uh, which is mentioned in the diagram that I showed you initially, uh, is staffing, right? So staffing is basically the process of recruiting, selecting, and advancing employees based on their ability, knowledge, and skills. Um, recruiting bit is the bit that we discussed when we were discussing the definition of public percent management. So it's basically another way of calling recruiting is procurement of labor force uh, from the industry generally. Selecting is that how do you select or choose all the employees which have all the individuals which have applied to your position in the organization. And advancing employee basically means how do you promote them um, on the basis of what criteria do you advance them towards other career levels or how do they climb the ladder within an organization and all of this is done based on their ability knowledge and skills essentially so staffing is broadly speaking staffing is actually composed of a variety of functions and we'll discuss each of these um, separately in the subsequent fields before we discuss these different elements of staffing it's important that we understand the distinction between merit versus and spoil system we've discussed this particular concept quite a bit in the past as well so within the broader um, discipline of public personnel management I think we really need to touch upon this particular aspect so let's quickly uh, discuss again what do we mean by the merit system what do we mean by the spoil system so merit system as we have discussed previously it's it's any system which is characterized by an open competition by which candidates um, or individuals um, are appraised or put made part of a certain position occupation or service right so the idea is that on the basis of competition you recruit different individuals and these individuals get to become part um, of your workforce so there are quite um, a few elements which uh, qualify a system to be a merit system so let's go through these one by one so the first element is uh, publicity of jobs what that particular means is that if you're following a merit a system you really need to wide, widely disseminate the job announcement so in certain organization what happens is that in uh, uh, through clandestine manners or through backdoor uh, negotiations you uh, um, sort of announce the position and you only get your affiliates or your relatives or for instance your friends to um, uh, apply for those jobs so a true merit system does not cater for that but rather in a true merit system you need to ensure that your uh, jobs are announced to the country at large for instance the other element of a merit system is that everybody needs to have an equal opportunity to apply right so it doesn't matter whether you come from a far-flung area of Balochistan or do you come from 
you know, a thriving area of Punjab, all of us, a candidate based in Balochistan should have an equal opportunity to apply for a public organization position as much as anybody who's applying from other parts of the country. The third element of a merit system is that you need to have realistic qualification standards for the position. I mean, you cannot have any sort of unrealistic requirements for the job. If you have unrealistic requirements which are not freely available in the market that you are tapping in. So naturally that impedes um, or that sort of hampers for you to establish a merit system. The fourth important element of a merit system is that there shouldn't be any sort of di discrimination while you're recruiting and selecting individuals. Uh, it shouldn't ma matter uh, what your religious affiliation is, what your caste is, or what your ethnicity is, what is your geogra geographical, uh, geographical location, it shouldn't matter. And strictly on the basis of qualification and skills, you should be hired for the position. The fifth um, element of a merit system is that uh, you should rank uh, the individuals or you should rank the applicants of a job on the basis of their ability. There shouldn't be um, sort of um, any sort of partial way of ranking individuals and how do you bring in partiality in a system when you rank uh, individuals on the basis of your connections with them or on the basis of um, your previous sort of affiliation with them. So you need to ensure that you, the ranking of um, in ability of individuals is done in an impartial and bias-free manner. The sixth element of the merit system, which is, I think, equally an important element, is that the knowledge of the final results need to be um, widely disseminated among the public as well, so that if I applied for a public service um, position, I should know ultimately what was the result of this uh, position. Did I make it or I didn't? Etc. Right. So, in contrast with the merit system, the other system that we have um, in public sector uh, organizations is the system of spoil system, and we've discussed this system quite a lot uh, in the past as well. Another term for spoil system is the patronage system, and in this particular case, candidates are appointed on the basis of their political affiliations to a particular political party, um, a political official. And, um, and this is in line with the different sources of entry that we discussed previously that one of the ways to enter the public service is if you're a political appointee selected um, on the basis of your political dis uh, disposition or your administrative talent for a particular position. So that's basically the spoil system. And again, different countries of the world have a mix of both systems. So certain countries strictly advocate having a merit system. Other countries of the world uh, propose that there should be a mix of both merit system and spoil system. And generally, as I had previously given the example of the US as well, spoil system is used for high level positions um, in some of the key agencies. And merit system is generally employed when you are um, recruiting entry level officers or mid level um, career specialist essentially right so let's move on so the next bit that we are going to talk about is the detailed recruitment process that um, public agencies essentially follow um, um, i've created this uh, nice i mean uh, sort of uh, diagram and the process goes from here till up here and then right here so um, different public organizations contain uh, more or less the same elements which are reflected here in, in, in this diagram. However, in some cases, the order um, or the sequence of the steps may vary. So it, it varies from organization to organization. So let's discuss this one by one. Um, so the first step um, in the recruitment process is the step called job requisition. So job requisition essentially means that um, you basically uh, request different ministries, different divisions to provide uh, or sort of um, to provide or sort of set out their demand for employees. So you have a central agency, central recruiting agency. In the case of Pakistan, you have Federal Public Service Commission, which is in charge um, for recruiting career level or um, CSS um aspirants and uh, please bear this in mind that FPSC individuals, um, FPSC as an organization can, can only recruit um, grade 17 level 
officers. So we'll discuss about F FPSC um, in, in the subsequent uh, lecture as well once we discuss civil services of Pakistan. So in this first step of job requisition is that you have your central recruitment agency in the case of Pakistan which is FPSC basically requests different ministry and divisions to provide how many employees do they need or in the future like for the next cycle for instance on the basis of the job requisition so now the agency knows exactly how many people let's say are required by a ministry of climate change for instance uh, or ministry of foreign affairs the next step in the recruitment process is that you need to determine the qualifications uh, minimum qualifications of all the candidates that need to possess in order to sort of go through this recruitment process so what could be their qualifications like do you need somebody who has a master's degree do you need somebody who has a bachelor's degree do you need a certain level of experience or not so all of these things come under this stage the next step is um once you have figured out the qualification requirements, so the next step is that you disseminate, disseminate the application forms for the position that you are essentially um, advertising. So how do you disseminate? I mean, there are different channels. It could be hard copies of application forms, which can be collected uh, by prospective applicants from, you know, um, across the country. Or another way could be, I mean, which is like a more contemporary way is that you basically just get an online form and then it varies whether you have to submit a form in an online fashion or do you print that form and then send it forward. The next step is that you advertise um, um, in different newspapers that, you know, this particular position is open and you're calling individuals to basically ask um uh, do you know whether you fulfill the per, per particular qualifications you need to submit the relevant documents in the in the set date um, and time for instance the next step is that once after the advertisement you are you have received the applications from the candidates the next step is that you scrutinize these applications on the basis of the qualifications that you had set out here so once the scrutiny of application is done and you basically finally figure out you know you know the, this is the number of individuals who, have, who meet the qualification requirements you send out a, like a notification to these individuals uh, for examination so you conduct examinations in this in the case of Pakistan it would be civil services examinations so once you have conducted these examinations the next step is basically certification which is short listing of candidates on the basis of their um uh, of their examination and once this short listing of individuals is done by different ministries ministry divisions the next step is you finally select them right so in this particular case a certain organization also have an interview stage as well so it's not mentioned here but in the case of pakistan we do have an interview before after conducting examination so selection is done you have you had a wide variety pool of individuals which apply to a position and on and you select just a few the next step is that once you've selected these individuals you send them some sort of an appointment letter uh, formally letting them know that they're officially part of this particular organization or this particular occupation group right and they're um, uh, known they're let know about this particular announcement once uh, this announcement is sent out now the individuals can formally join the public sector organization and initially they are, there's generally a probation period that they have to serve and uh, in certain organizations for this probation period in order to sort of um, you know uh, come out of this probation period they either have to take a test uh, or they have to complete a certain training so that that happens in different countries of the world as well once you have created um, sort of um, you have fulfilled the probation period then in certain organizations certain countries you are placed to your respective um, organizations respective occupation groups and the last bit is that after placement you go through a orientation to be become part of a particular occupation group so please bear this in mind that these three steps the sequence of these steps can actually vary in different parts of the world essentially so in certain places this orientation can come after appointment as well Right, right away you orient them, you provide them certain sort of skills, um, sort of uh, letting them know what are their expectations 
um, um, from the work? Uh, what are some of the norms and values? How do the employees need to conduct themselves, right? So this can actually come here and then you can have the probation period and then the placement period. In some cases, this even placement period is uh, here after appointment as well, whereby right away you know exactly on the basis of your examinations and the marks that you get in your examination and interview whether you will be placed in let's say ministry of foreign affairs or you know uh, pakistan administrative services depending on your merits right so these steps you need to bear in mind i mean what they are uh, but please keep in mind that it's okay for these steps to uh, the sequence of these steps to change a little Moving on, so all of these things that I've just mentioned, uh, verbally mentioned, all of them are written here. You can take a look. Okay, so the next step is basically personnel selection, right? How do you select individuals? Um, so uh, the idea is there are different selection procedures for choosing candidates to work in your organization. So there could be multiple criteria. The first could be you look at them on the basis of their uh, education and occupational skills. Uh, apart from that, certain organizations also conduct interviews. And the idea is that you try to understand or sort of uh, figure out the soft skills which are possessed by your candidates, soft skills in terms of the communication skills, in terms of their leadership potential, etc. Certain public agencies also have these intelligence tests as well, whereby they try to understand um, the psychological performance uh, or intelligent performance of individuals. Um, the fourth element or one another type of uh, selection procedure is performance tasks. Performance tasks are essentially this case study based questions or simulation based questions which essentially test technical knowledge of individuals, right? And the last is which is also a form of psychological test is your personality test in terms of seeing whether um, your personality or your characteristics are a good fit for the organization that you are applying to, right? So this was personnel selection. Moving on, so the next element of the public personnel management system is compensation, which in other ways is, you know, how do you set the wages for your public sector employees? So most uh, large governmental personnel system base their um, pay plans or compensation plans on a classification or a rank system, right? So they basically divide their employees um, in different ranks. And on the basis of these ranks, they set that somebody who's at the rank one, all of these employees in rank one should get the same sort of pay structure. Somebody who's in rank 12, he should have the same pay structure, right? So the idea is that in this rank system, you define a series of grades and each grade containing a set of particular jobs, tasks that they're supposed to do are similar in terms of the difficulty and the type of work that needs to be done. So Pakistan is a good example. In Pakistan, we have 22 basic pay scales, BPS scales. In, uh, they're also called BPS scales. And here, somebody who is a grade 17 officer, the idea is that all grade 17 officers are going to get the same amount of pay packages, perks, privileges. And somebody who's in grade 20 is going to get the same amount of compensation. Uh, and the important comp uh, bit about government pay plans or government compensation plans is that they're generally made public and a you and I, like the common man, can actually look up online how many, um, how much money a grade 20 officer is, for instance, uh, liable to get. The idea for having this particular aspect is to show greater transparency in the way, um, you know, wages are actually provided to the civil servants. So the next important element of public personnel management system is um, training and development. So it's the process of developing skills, habits, knowledge, and attitudes in employees for the purpose of increasing the effectiveness of employees in their present government positions, as well as preparing employees for future government positions. So the idea is, um, according to this particular definition, that you are ensuring that you are employees are equipped with the right skills for their present government functions for the present for the functions that they need to perform uh, in the current scenario 
but at the same time you're also ensuring that your employees are ready for um, any future challenges that they have to face they have to orient themselves in right so moving on whenever organizations um, basically plan on coming up with training and development activities they need to be mindful of certain elements which need to be included in a training system so let's go through these um, elements one by one so the first element of a training system is training needs assessment the second element is training program design the third element is training program de delivery and the fourth element is training program evaluation so let's discuss these elements one by one in terms of training needs assessment um, whenever you know organizations are developing training needs uh, training programs um, they basically uh, a general practice which is adopted by a good organization is that they inquire about the existing skills um, of the employees which are going to be provided training activities um, and generally what they do is that they send some sort of a survey to these employees asking them what are some of the skills that they want to learn and what are their expectations from the training program which is going to be run in the future um, just to give you an example so there's this uh, organization called united nations system staff college so this particular organization provides um, staff trainings to un staff members uh, members of civil society you know members of ngos etc so one of the things that they do before conducting these training programs is that they s send out this learning needs assessment survey and as part of the survey there are a couple of questions which basically uh, try to test the existing knowledge of training participants and the idea is to see with, whether you know the knowledge of individuals is up to the mark or whether certain skills are deficient and the second component of this learning needs assessment survey is to basically ask participants their expectations from the training program that they are going to attend so on the basis of this uh, assessment uh, which is basically held prior to conducting the training program you design the training uh, according to this needs assessment the survey results that you have gotten so in this training program design there are certain things that you need to be mindful of you need to figure out the venue of the training program where it's going to be held you need to figure out uh, the type of format uh, which is going to be uh, through which you know your training program is going to be conducted whether it's going to be a uh, one day workshop multiple day workshop you also need to figure out the speakers or um, trainers which are going to be providing training you also need to figure out the kind of audience uh, that you're going to attract in this particular element and in the program design you need to tailor um, your training program according to the audience that you're essentially going to get um, the third element of um, this training system is basically the final program delivery of the training program so all of the things that you basically designed or planned in this particular stage these are implemented and executed here the last and f uh, fourth um, element of a training system is basically training program evaluation this is uh, probably the most important step in any training program because in this particular step you try to ask your training participants whether um, they have actually learned something or whether the, the learning outcomes of a particular program have been met or not now the challenge in this particular uh, stage is that naturally once the training program concludes let's say after two three days um, the training program comes to an end so you can ask your participants to fill out a survey for instance and the participants if they're happy with the training program they'll probably give you positive feedback but there needs to be a second aspect of this evaluation as well the second aspect is basically you want to assess whether your um, employees have actually gained skills that they are actually applying in their day-to-day -day work so certain organizations good organizations which have well-developed training systems what they do is that after the conclusion of the training program so probably after three months or six months 
they send out another survey to the training participants asking them whether these guys um, have learned are actually you know applying the skills that they have learned in the training program and you basically ask them whether there are any deficiencies in the training program that they faced this is probably the most uh, you can say uh, this is probably the best way to assess whether a training program has been successful or not moving on so uh, another important element of public personnel management system is basically advancement and promotion so what is advancement or promotion it's basically simply climbing the ladder within an organization to higher positions and naturally these higher positions have come with you know greater levels of authority greater power over you know a greater number of subordinates and naturally it also signifies a better compensation or more pay as compared to the lower ranks or uh, lower positions so there are a couple of principles um, of promotion which are followed by different public organizations so there are essentially three main principles so let's go through these one by one so the, so the first principle is the seniority principle according it's it's quite intuitive what that particularly means is that um while whenever you are making promotions you are just looking at the duration of the service of the employees and whoever has the longest service in any organization that uh, particular person is going to be promoted to the next scale the second principle is the merit principle um in this particular case the major promotion criteria is not the duration or the time that you have served in 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 a bureaucracy or in a public organization but rather uh, you are promoted to the next uh, scale on the basis of your qualifications and achievements that you have basically come up with in the previous year or uh, previous quarter for instance and the third element third principle is basically a combination of the the above mentioned principles it's basically the principle which combines seniority plus merit it simply means that promotion is based on the basis of you know how much uh, on the basis of the length of service um, that you have completed in the organization as well as on the basis of your qualifications and achievements and in most uh, public organizations of the world actually the third principle a mix of seniority plus merit principle is actually utilized in organizations right so moving on the last element within the broader public management public personnel management system is disciplinary action um in some previous lectures if you guys remember i had mentioned that whenever uh, civil servants or public servants join a public organization they generally sign uh, terms of conditions for their service and they need to abide by a certain uh, code of conduct which is instituted in a public organization so disciplinary action is basically action which is taken against a civil servant whenever he basically violates uh, conduct rules while you know uh, dispensing his services or whenever he is performing on the job so there are basically different ways in which you can violate uh, code of conduct within an organization so just to give you guys some examples um so let's say if you are engaging in some sort of corrupt behavior if you bribe uh, you know an individual who is seeking public services from your organization or if you take a gift which is not allowed by your organization these are you know um, some examples of violation of code of conduct and these particular violations are actually examples of some major violations which happen within organization so i'm sure all of you have this understanding that violations vary in terms of their severity um and you can see these violations on the basis of a continuum and naturally your superior um is in the best position to sort of assess where does your violation or where does the violation of civil servant fall on the continuum so um disciplinary action basically um sometimes also results in formulation of formal committees which try to assess the behavior or misconduct of civil servants and as part of this committee the idea is that after you have done like a unbiased uh, impartial investigation into the matter you end up giving certain uh, major and minor penalties to the individuals who have been charged with misconduct 
Now again, uh, the nature of penalties varies according to the violation that you have done essentially and all of this is assessed by the committee that I had uh, just mentioned. So let's go through what are some of the minor and major penalties which are used by different public organizations. Let's start with minor penalties. Uh, one of the penalty is, um, you know, just censure or reprimand. Censure is that you are superior um, or, you know, your immediate boss basically uh, shows his disapproval for your actions and reprimand is that you know he basically tells it, it's similar to censure that he dip, dis, uh, disapproves and you know sort of um, tells you that uh, whatever you did it, it's absolutely wrong and you know you shouldn't be doing something like this in the future another penalty is uh, which is slightly more severe than the first penalty is that your increments or bonuses, um, if you're qualified for them, they are going to be withheld. Um, that is like in the next cycle, if you are supposed to get one or two increments or two bonuses as a result of your violation, the organization might say that this time, this year around, you're not going to get that. Another type of minor penalty is basically withholding promotion. Again, this is slightly more severe than the other two, which is that let's say if you were going to be promoted from BPS scale 17 to BPS scale 18 in the next month for instance so as a result of your violation of the code of conduct your promotion will be basically withheld and the last penalty is basically that if uh, your violation resulted in in a lot of pecuniary or financial loss to your public organization you are going to be asked asked by the organization to basically return or to sort of compensate the organization with the loss that you had incurred right uh, moving on so let's discuss some major penalties so one of the major penalties is basically demotion to a lower scale or rank demotion is basically the opposite of promotion it means that if you're currently in uh, grade 20 and you basically were involved in some sort of misconduct your uh, you know grade 20 position is going to be taken back and now you are going to be demoted or sort of regressed back to grade you know 19. Uh, another uh, penalty is uh, that you are forced to take retirement uh, which basically means that you are forced to um, leave the organization early so let's say if you were supposed to retire at the age of 60 but at the age of 40 or 45 you know um, you know you were involved in some sort of misconduct you are asked to leave the organization early and again th this this depends on the severity of the misconduct that you have been involved in the third type of penalty is removal from service so there are two things uh, in terms of how you leave the organization um, so compulsory retirement I've already mentioned the other two are removal from service and dismissal from service so it's important that you understand the difference between the two once you're removed from service uh, it means that you're asked to leave your organization uh, however at a future point in time uh, you can actually reapply to the same or reapply to the same position and join the same organization right uh, the last remedy which is dismissible from service you can say it's probably the most severe kind of penalty it means that you are asked to leave the organization and um, in the future you're absolutely disqualified to join the organization again right so you can say that these two the these last two services are quite you know strict and the difference between these last two um, points last two penalties and this compulsory retirement is that this particular um, penalty is slightly more lenient why because uh, with retirement you know you are also eligible to get some sort of pension plans as well so you are asked to for leave the organization but you are still eligible for pension plans which come with your retirement in this particular case in terms of removal from service and dismissal from service you are actually asked to leave the organization and in most cases you are not promised any sort of retirement package right so this was basically the last element that 
constitute the public personnel management system i'll just quickly go back to this figure um, that i showed you initially we have covered how organization how individuals enter organizations we have covered the entry points this particular rectangle shows how you know the different elements one uh, in uh, individuals become part of an organization and these are the three ways in which you basically leave the organization so i have covered these three elements under the discipline so this bit grievances is left so the idea is that once we discuss civil services of pakistan i'll tell you guys in detail what are the grievance mechanisms which are available to civil servants so that this basically concludes um our um the uh, our discussion on different elements of public personnel management systems very quickly um i want us to discuss some of the contemporary issues in public managed personnel management system and uh, there are qu quite a lot of issues that could be discussed but um for the sake of time i think i'll just discuss um like one or two issues basically so let's start uh, with this phenomena of affirmative action mm, i hope you guys have heard this term before um in 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 different context if you haven't no problem we'll quickly discuss what it is affirmative action is basically planned aggressive coherent management program which is designed to promote equal opportunity for disadvantaged groups right so it is basically intentional action which is taken by governments around the world or even private sector entities and the idea of taking this action is to provide opportunities for disadvantaged groups in the country or in the locality or in the region that you're working in with the idea that they should also be included in public employment right and uh, the major premise behind this idea of affirmative action is that due to past discriminatory practices against certain members of society certain groups have been left out of the process uh, or have been locked into lower paying occupations and the idea is that your playing field uh, in which different individuals compete is neither level or fair so i mean i i know this sounds a bit too much but i i think this will become a little clearer when you when i explain you with an example so let's take an example of um african americans in the case of the us uh, all of us i think know that african americans in the past have faced a lot of discriminatory practices um by you know um the white members of society and these discriminatory practices have basically resulted in low levels of uh, participation or low levels of employment by these member or by you know uh, african americans in the american public sector right what is the issue about that the issue with this particular idea is that if these people are not represented in public services they are not going to be able to design programs which are going to fulfill the needs of the same ethnicity or the same group right so the idea of affirmative action is to basically increase opportunities for minorities through pro positive government action which is naturally backed by laws rules and regulations so a simple example of i mean uh, affirmative action is that you try to seek racial or gender balance in workforce right so you try to have this quota system quota system again is an example of affirmative action you try to ensure that um if your public services um uh, the uh, like the total proportion of your public services is 100% so out of this 100% you need to ensure that at least 20% of individuals come from let's say african american background that's just one example in the case of pakistan the example could be that um let's say in balochistan individuals do not have um as much of education opportunities for various reasons and therefore they somehow therefore the playing field is somehow not level or fair for them right because at the back there's not uh, you know that they they're not like very great opportunities so as a result of that they they have been unable to let's say 
pass the civil services exam or to become part of the bureaucracy so so the government in order to ensure that there is a playing leveled playing field it tries to institute or take uh, quotas or institute or quotas or you know take affirmative action by ensuring that let's say 6 or 10 percent proportional to the overall population of pakistan Baloji should be part of a civil services so that's an example of affirmative action uh, moving on so like um, an extension of this notion of um, affirmative action is this idea of representative bureaucracy this idea basically emerged during the late 1960s um, in the context of US and it emerged side by side with the civil rights movement um, which was led by um, Martin Luther Jr. And the idea of um, this uh, representative bureaucracy, I've, I think hinted about it already, is that your public bureaucracy simply should be represented of the population as a whole, right? So even though in Pakistan you can say uh, Punjabis are a dominant ethnic group, but that doesn't mean that in your public bureaucracy all the individuals need to be or all the decision make makers need to hail from this particular region. So naturally it makes sense that a public servant or a bureaucrat who's going to be serving in Balochistan, it makes sense that this guy also comes from the same region, same background, because he understands the context uh, of that region. He has seen, um, you know, inequalities or he has seen how you know um, how his region has been deprived of opportunities and naturally the person from the same ethnicity will be in a better position to deliver services and uh, as part of this notion of representative bureaucracy you basically try to include uh, members from all socioeconomic backgrounds races and religions as well and as i just mentioned representative bureaucracy is basically just affirmative action which is applied to the public bureaucracy so that basically concludes our week eight lecture on public personnel management uh, before we move on to week 10 i just want to tell you guys uh, what you need to do for the next week so uh, next week we are going to discuss civil services of pakistan for that um, you know you have to read this chapter 20 through chapter 23 uh, titled as Civil Service System and Reforms in Pakistan. You already know that this book is already available on LMS. So please make sure that before you see the next video lecture, you should have read um, this chapter beforehand. And again, I mean, uh, if you have any questions regarding this particular lecture or about this assigned reading for the next week, please drop me an email. You guys already have my email address and just let me know. I'll be happy to clarify any ambiguities so see you guys next week